So I invite you on the next in-breath to tighten everything, every single muscle you can find. And then the key is very slowly on the out breath, let them go. And again, tighten, tighten, tighten on the in breath, exaggerating the chronic holding you carry around all day long. And then on the out breath, And one last time, tighten, tighten, tighten on the in-breath. And then letting go on the out-breath. Now the invitation is on the next in-breath, tighten your belly. Really, really tighten it. You take it all the way back to your spine. And then on the out-breath, let it go. Let it be soft and open. And again, tighten your belly on the in-breath and tighten all the way down into your pelvic floor and all the way back to your anal sphincter. Tighten, tighten. And then let go on the out-breath. And one last time, tightening, holding, uh, really bringing that belly all the way back to your spine, all the way down into your pelvic floor, and then letting go. And now, allow your belly to be soft. Just stay with noticing your belly. It may want to tighten right back up again. It's so used to guarding. But in these few precious moments, I invite you to keep on relaxing your belly all the way down into your pelvic floor and back to your anal sphincter. With your attention there, invite all of that chronic holding in your pelvic region to not only soften, but to stay soft. And notice when you drift back up into your mind again, you're no longer paying attention to your belly. How easy it is, especially it starts with the anal sphincter. It starts holding again. And then invite it to let go. And now for just a few more breaths, ride the waves of your breath. Using your breath as your anchor. Being available to the only moment that matters. Now. And when you're ready, open your eyes. And so welcome one and all. And I really invite you as we explore today to to just keep on checking into your belly. Uh, Sometimes it's kind of hard to really get how much your belly is holding. It's easier to notice your anal sphincter. You know, there is no, what's that statement? Oh my God, we're such a tight ass society, you know, or that's such a tight ass person, you know, the, uh, Uh, Your anal sphincter is such a great biofeedback mechanism to how much that you hold. So again, just soften it. And see, as you soften your anal sphincter, it gives space for the belly to soften. So 
here we are exploring again, healing, but also being healed by our compulsions. What a radical notion. And if all you take out of this course are these two main things, number one, your compulsion is not something that is wrong with you or something you are doing wrong. It is a finely crafted survival system. Remember the three layers we talked about, you know, how the top layer is the control layer. And when that doesn't uh, do its job, we then go into our compulsions, which is the act of turning away from ourselves. The second layer is all the bound up energy inside of us. You know, we call them feelings, but really it's bound up energy. It's our, it's our not enoughness. It's our fear. It's our helplessness. It's our despair. It's our loneliness. It's our anger. And then the bottom layer, which is the vastness of who you really are. And so to begin to shift out of compulsions are something that's wrong with me into the our finely crafted survival system that has been taking care of the energies that you don't didn't were taught how to take care of that begins to change your whole relationship with them from enemy to ally and the other piece that's so important, and the reason why I'm going over these each week is because uh, we need to hear these, because this is such a, uh, it's like uh, my publisher, the subtitle they chose for the book, The Gift of Our Compulsions, is a revolutionary approach to compulsions. And so the other piece that's so important is to get control doesn't work. And yet, you know, I felt, you know, for most of the time I was caught in my compulsions that there was something wrong with me that I wasn't able to uh, control them or fix them or get rid of them. But I've given you enough statistics to help you see that control only empowers what we're trying to control. And so we're looking at a new way of being with our compulsions. And it's a way that begins to move energy. Remember when we shaked our hands, you know, I can't remember if we did it in the first or the second week, but you could feel those tingles. You could feel energy moving in your hands. And that is how you were when you first arrived on this planet. Energy flowed freely through you and you knew the joy of being alive. But slowly, <laughs> you, like everybody else, began to tighten, began to uh, get lost in your head, began to become a human doing rather than a human being. And of course, then compulsions come to try to manage all the parts that you have disowned inside of you. I want you to get the sense of how that contains your energy. Just think of the last time that you were compulsive and, you know, and here is this tightening that happens and then the, here is this need to get away from what we are experiencing and then we go to our compulsions and then you know, we have these brief moments of a, a, a release from this tightness from this tension only to have the judger come and despair come and oh my god i'll never get out of this what's wrong with me you know, um, I'm to blame. What I want you to hear is that you are not responsible for your compulsions. You are responsible to your compulsions. And we need to look at the word responsible, the ability to respond. So the power of compulsions is not only will they not be healed through control. In fact, it makes us even tighter. 
but they are an invitation. They are a doorway out of the bubble of struggle and back into the joy of being fully alive. So there's two core things that are stronger than the urge to be compulsive. And as you all well know, the urge to be compulsive is a very powerful force. And we live in an extremely addicted society, a extremely compulsive society. You know, and we are conditioned. We are conditioned to struggle with our experience, to try to get rid of it and get to the good stuff. The power of compulsions is that that not only doesn't work, but it begins to wake you up to what does work. So there's two things. There's actually three things that are stronger than our compulsions. And the third we'll look at next week. The first we looked at last week, the phenomenal power of your attention. This is what Rooney was uh, trying to uh, allude to in the, uh, the guest house, uh, which Rumi, he's a Persian poet and he is really the most popular poet in, in, in the world now. And the guest house is one of his most popular poems by far. And he says something like this. I, I won't get all the lines correct, but this is basically the essence of this poem. Oh, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a meanness, a depression, a compulsion. Meet them at the door laughing because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond to clear you out for some new delight. <laughs> That's not how we are trained to be with uh, our uh, meanness, our depressions, our compulsions. You know, Rumi is basically saying, if you can bring your attention, you meet them at the door laughing, I've never been able to do that but at least I can meet them at the door quicker and quicker in curiosity. And we looked last week, I mean, you know, I think one of the examples I gave you is if you're sitting on a bus and, and somebody that isn't looking at their phone, you look at the back of their head, they will eventually turn around. Attention is a phenomenal force. And as we talked about at the end of last week, it's very, very powerful to strengthen the muscle of your attention. There's something that I do, you know, when I teach a, a basic course and I invite people to take their finger and, you know, bring it all around. These are the 65,000 thoughts we have a day. And so off we go. We're just off to the races and we tumble from one thought to another and then our compulsions come because there's all sorts of stuff inside of us that we don't know how to meet. And then we hate ourselves and we try to control our compulsions and we're just lost in this, okay? The power of attention, when you begin to pull your attention out of this. Now, this is what it's like for most people. They just follow their thoughts wherever they go, okay? So learning how to strengthen the muscle of your attention is about learning how to notice something other than the struggles in your mind. And of course, you could do that only for a moment or two and then whoop, we're back again. But every time you bring your attention back to something, we talked about the sounds, we talked about you know, uh, your coffee, you know, in the morning to really bring your attention out of the normal way your mind uses your attention, which is just to tumble from one thought to another all day long. And you actually bring your attention out of this tumbling and you actually bring it here for life. Now, in the beginning, uh, that's practically impossible to do. This is why most people are part-time meditators. You know, because they sit down and then, you know, 10 minutes later, they have planned their whole day. 
but if you realize like what Stephen Levine taught me, because I was a part-time meditator, if you sit for an hour and you bring your attention back to your focus, one time in that hour, time is well spent. Why is that? Because in that moment, you are using your mind in a new way. You are using your mind to connect with life rather than always trying to understand it, fix it, change it, rearrange it, or control it. And so it does take uh, some uh, uh, ability to strengthen the muscle of your attention. That's why I recommended last week to you know, give yourself five minutes a day where you choose a focus, whether it's your breath or your sensations or the sounds around you. And no matter how many times you wander off, when you see you're wandering off, you say story, and then you bring your attention back. Every time you do that, you are strengthening the muscle of your attention. And that is what you can take into the waves of compulsion that at the beginning, you can only usually do that afterwards. And that is when you begin to be able to see, oh, I got caught again. And that, what is my mind doing right now? Excuse me, my cat is playing on my lap. So that's why the, <laughs> the computer is moving around. Um, so, what usually happens after a wave of compulsion goes through is either we get caught in despair, I'll never get out of this, or we get caught in uh, judgment. Oh my God, I did it again. I am the most weak-willed ninny on the planet. You know, what's wrong with me? To be able to bring your attention into what you are experiencing in that moment is phenomenal. And the more you develop your attention, the more you can begin to wake up right at the beginning of a wave of compulsion, whereas your attention can head you in a different direction than numbing yourself out with compulsions. So that's the first thing that is more powerful than your compulsions. The only thing that is more powerful than your compulsions. The second thing is your heart. What do I mean by that? Well, science has now shown that we have three brains. Well, actually science has shown that our whole body is a brain, but there's three places that it is more focused than uh, you know, in the body. The first is the head brain, and that's what you have come to know. That's where you live most all the time. The second is the gut brain. And oh my God, science is doing so much now about the gut brain and how deeply it affects you know, the head brain. But the third is your heart brain. And it is literally a brain. They have now shown it, it you know, it, uh, uh, creates neurons, it, it, it uh, creates uh, neurohormones, it, it remembers, it feels, it senses. You know, they say that it makes more oxytocin than the brain does. I mean, this is just phenomenal, this heart brain. Now, how is that different from our head brain? Well, all you got to do is look at history to see what the head brain has brought forth. Our head brain is dualistic in nature. It likes this, it doesn't like that. It thinks this is good, that is bad. It thinks it is good if the color of your skin is white. It thinks it is bad if the color of your skin is darker than white. I mean, you know, if an alien came and landed on our planet and they saw what we were doing, they would laugh hysterically that we are valuing people by the color of their skin, by their sexual preferences, by their religion, 
but that's what your head brain does. And your head brain is what has gotten you into such a pickle around your compulsions. It has been trying to uh, use your compulsions to control your experience. And then it tries to control the compulsions. And I want you to see how that just turns into quicksand. And I also want you to see how deeply that contracts you out of this natural, alive, flowing energy. And so in my world, this is an evolutionary process. You know, my goodness, you know, at one time the earth was just molten and gas and dust and so on and so forth. And oh my, now it's, oh my God, there's polar bears and majestic icebergs and there's, you know, trees draped with orchids and colorful parrots and there's baby spitter dolphins and there's little tiny, um, uh, you know, wildflowers. Life is a constantly evolving process. And at this point in evolution, it was Jonas Salk that said for the first time in evolution, it is happening within the human mind. Well, I would say it's happening in the human heart. The heart brain is so different than the head brain. It unites rather than divides. It responds rather than reacts. It includes rather than excludes. And the heart brain has room for everything. And yet this deeply sensitive, this deeply sensing, amazing brain there in the center of your chest it was not safe for you when you were young to keep it open. It was bruised, it was battered. Even if we had parents that loved us, they were basically unconscious giants. And so we closed down our hearts and we ran away to our heads and we had been trying to make ourselves be what we think we should be our whole lives because we don't have access to our heart brain. So this is the other thing that is more powerful than your urge to be compulsive. And this is what you long for more than anything in your life. You long to come home to your heart. You long to fall in love with yourself as you are. And yet that is not our experience. My daughter has invited me to a couple of her AA meetings and, uh, and just, you know, she is one of those really blessed people that have really, she says, I found my peeps. You know, the two meetings I went to, uh, it is just a community of the heart. And in one of the meetings, um, they were saying, we don't shoot our wounded ones. You know, and you could see with people that were sharing, there was a woman that shared in this meeting that had been, you know, so... Um, uh, caught in the world of drugs that she lost her children. She basically has lost, you know, most all of her teeth, you know, this powerful urge to turn away from herself. And she now is turning towards. And she shared that what kept her in the land of drugs and kept her going back to them and not coming to meetings was the shame of it. Oh my God, we are unbelievably cruel with ourselves. We have been trained to be ashamed of ourselves. And why wouldn't we want to be compulsive? If you had one moment of really truly being open 
to what shame is like inside of you, you would want to numb it out. You would want to go away from it. And so here is this, this sense that my compulsion is something wrong with me and I'm bad and wrong when I go to my compulsion. And then the shame comes and then we have to go to our compulsions again and then we get caught in this vicious circle. The only thing that heals that is the heart. This meeting that I went to where the woman spoke about her shame uh, was an all women's meeting. And it was, you know, when my daughter and I left and I, we were standing out in front of the building where they met, I said, my God, what happened in there is what everybody really longs for, a place where the main movement is the heart. It's inclusion. It is acceptance. It is honoring what is rather than making it bad or wrong. Both of these skills that we are learning, the power to pay attention to your experience and the power to begin to meet it in your heart, which means giving it space, not being at war with whatever you are experiencing. Those are the two things that begin to move energy again. They begin to loosen all the constraints of the tightness that you have taken on in your life. And it begins to remind you that it's okay to be yourself. You're not perfect. There's a, a wonderful Zen quote I put at the end of Belonging to Life, which was my first book that I wrote. Freedom comes when we are without anxiety about non-perfection. Wow. Freedom, nothing less than freedom, comes when we are without anxiety about non-perfection. And it's the heart that knows that. It is the heart that has room for everything. It is the heart, in the heart, that we can begin to accept ourselves as we are. You know, Stephen Levine, when I very, was very first with him, because he's my, really my main mentor, and he's six feet tall, and he said, you know, you take a step down the path of life and you go a couple of feet. But if you fall flat on your face, you go six feet down the path of life. I want you to get that sense that, that what we're looking at is what closes the heart now. And that is a, a very skillful thing to do in order to allow the heart to open again. But just you know, take a, a quick inventory of all the screw ups in your life. And what would happen if you frame them just like we're framing our compulsions? They're not something bad or wrong. Stephen's saying you actually move down the path of life when you screw up. The other thing I love to say is that we're all given a, uh, a pile of shit, you know, when we're growing up. And, uh, and what we do is we try to put a tarp over the shit and, you know, when we uh, try to uh, get people to haul it away, but there's always some left and we track it all over our house and so on and so forth. But God, if you take a wheelbarrow out there and you fill it with that shit and you take it to your garden, you can grow the most amazing garden. So we all have taken on shit. And we've tried to use our compulsions to manage that. What I am saying is find the courage 
to begin to engage. Using the power of your attention. And we'll look more so next week how you can bring that into your compulsion. But I don't, you know, it's like I've said before, I don't want to give you too many how-tos. Because your mind will just use those how-tos to try to change your experience. And I don't think you can not, not go through that phase. But my job is to keep on waking up this investigation inside of you, this fascination. Oh, isn't it interesting? I have my head in the refrigerator, or I have just uh, poured a huge glass of scotch, or you know, I have uh, um, gotten the pills out that I have hidden in the uh, back of my closet to begin to become curious about that. And we only can become curious if we really begin to meet where we are with our heart, that the heart doesn't fight with it. The heart has space for it all. So how do we make it safe for our heart to open again? <laughs> We've been exploring the first way. And that is to get to know what closes your heart. And, you know, having worked with people for over 30 years, um, it, uh, one of the most powerful things you can do is to see how unbelievably judgmental you can be with yourself. Remember the head brain. It thinks this is good, that is bad, this is right, that is wrong. And when we were very young, we needed these unconscious giants. We needed attention more than we needed food for survival. And because our parents or our caretakers were basically uh, not present, you know, they had left themselves a long time ago, we began to decide two things. Number one, we have to be what we think they want us to be to purchase the connection. And number two, that because we're the center of the universe, if there's anything off in our world, uh, we think that we are to blame. You know, there was a study done once of children and divorced parents, and even up to the age of 12, even if kids were told they didn't cause the divorce, they felt they caused the divorce. So this begins to feed this judging quality of your mind that can be so unmerciful and feel like it is absolute truth. Um, in my world, I felt that my judging quality in my mind uh, graduated uh, uh, top in its class at law school and was president of the debate club. <laughs> you know, it could convince me of anything. That's why I ate and drank so much. That's why I tried to kill myself three times, you know, because I just wanted to get away from this agony, the agony of not being okay as I am. And uh, it was when I began to become curious. Again, the power of investigation, the power of attention. I began to become curious about this voice. And uh, I carried a notebook around because, you know, I said, okay, well, I'm going to start watching this voice and seeing what it is saying. And the judge said, uh, me? I don't judge you. And so I had to carry a notebook around, a little, you know, a little spiral notebook, you know, that fit in my purse or fit in my pocket. And I began to catch these different times that my mind would be extremely cruel and I would write it down. And then I went and wrote it on a newsprint, you know, in my bedroom, you know, and I could see outside of me this unbelievable self-cruelty. And... I could see how scared it was. And that's the amazing thing about learning how to investigate, learning how to be curious, is that the more that you are here, the more you see what is going on, 
it becomes safe for your heart to open again. <laughs> and believe you me, that is what you are longing for, is to live from your heart. But there's a lot of armoring you know, around your heart, as there is around everybody. So the first thing that you can do is get to know the armoring. And usually it, it has some uh, thing to do with this unbelievable self-cruelty that we have been trained in. Get to know it. I call it look to unhook. And now this voice has a very little power over me. You know, if I'm really tired and, and there's something going on with my kids that is just very challenging, you know, that voice will come. But I say, well, hi, you're having a bad day. I am able to relate to it rather than believe what it is saying. The power of compulsions is that they, they are so wrapped up in shame. And yet, when you don't try to fix them, but you begin to engage with them, like we are engaging with the judging qualities of our mind, that is the phenomenal power of your own attention to heal. Now, you can also begin to cultivate an open heart. And I just invite you right now, either put your hand over your heart or just breathe in and out through your heart. This is, both of these are so powerful. You know, I oftentimes drive with a hand over my heart, just signaling my mind to drop into my heart. And when things are very challenging, it is also, I find myself just breathing in and out through my heart or tapping it or patting it or rubbing it. Anything to wake up this amazing brain there in the center of your chest. And so I begin every day breathing in and out through my heart so that the trajectory of my day goes more towards the heart rather than towards the mind. Another thing that you can do is begin to uh, create a kindness practice. And there's been so much that has been said about, you know, kindness for other people. Practice random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty. But there's actually very little that has been written about the most important person, the person that most deserves your kindness, which is you. We're not good at that. In fact, we even think that's selfish. Well, it's actually selfful. So you can begin to, um, uh, you know, have a practice where you do at least one kind thing for you every day. Or you, you write a love letter to yourself. <laughs> I want you to get this sense that this brain is so different than that brain. And we want to cultivate it. You know, another wonderful thing to do is, is you know, so many people are, you know, uh, very empowered by a gratitude practice. And that's very, very wonderful to do. But what would it be like to have a practice where at the end of the day, you think of three things that are wonderful about you? You know, when somebody first asked me to do this, this was before I ever had started this work, you know, with my compulsions and, you know, and, and the judger and all that. Uh, you know, he was a therapist and he said, okay, uh, I invite you to uh, write down three things every day that you did write. And so I came to see him the next time. And he said, well, how'd you do? And he said, I couldn't write anything down. I didn't do anything right. 
that's how deeply I was caught in my head. And of course, even more deeply caught because I was trying to numb myself out from all that heartache. And then I would hate myself for being compulsive and I would hate myself for not being able to control the compulsions. And he said to me, he said, did you take a shower this morning? I said, yeah. And he said, did you pick up the bath mat after you took the shower? I said, yeah. He said, okay, number one, pick up bath mat. <laughs> so I want you to get that sense that maybe if you do a gratitude practice now, that you begin to do a practice at the end of the day that just acknowledge three wonderful things about you or wonderful things that you have done. These two skills, the power of curiosity or attention or investigation, they all, you know, I'm all alluding to the same thing. Uh, and the getting to know the armoring around your heart and then beginning to open it. Oh my God, the phenomenal energy that is available to you your heart is as vast as the universe. Your mind is as limited in time, but your heart is as big as the universe. You know, they did a uh, study at HeartMath Institute uh, down in California that they, um, they put people in front of computers that randomly chose beautiful or horrific pictures. And they hook these people up to body sensors, heart sensors, and mind sensors. And, uh, and for every single person, the heart always responded first, then the brain, and then it sent the information to the body. But for many people, the heart responded six to eight seconds before the computer even chose the picture. I want you to let that in. Just let that in for a moment. Oh my God. The heart is connected to everything. And if you begin to really understand that your compulsions are your teacher, your compulsions are the doorway back into your heart, you know, as Stephen Levine would say, may you be so lucky to come across something you can't control. Well, for us, it doesn't have to be a, uh, a death sentence or a, a, a terminal illness, you know, or, you know, quadriplegic or, you know, ALS. For us, we don't have to wait until the body breaks down. It is our compulsions that if we allow them, they will be our guide. They will be our teacher back into what we most deeply long for, to live from our hearts. So I want to just say one other thing, and then I'll turn it over to questions. You know, either you can, you know, hit the chat button and type things, or, you know, you can uh, you know, hit the participants button, and then the little golden hand will come on the, uh, the little window on your right-hand side. That when Anita Morjani, who wrote Dying to Be Me, who was a woman that had, uh, she had fought cancer for years and years. And now she was, uh, what do they say? Your, your organs are shutting down. Okay, and she's in the hospital and she is just filled from you know, her neck down to the bottom of her pelvis with lemon-sized uh, tumors. And they've tried everything. And so she dies, you know? for a short period of time. And she writes about those moments when she began to hover above her body and then began to move out into the vast spaciousness. She said, I can't even put it into words, but the best word I can describe it is love. That she said, this was beyond anything that I had ever even imagined or known in my whole life. 
you know, if I remember, I'll try to pull out her book and read what she says. And she says it so much more eloquently than I do. But that is what she saw was the truth. That you and I are made out of love. We breathe love. We drink love. We are love. And right in front of this computer is this beautiful bay window that looks out of my magical garden. And yes, there's all sorts of, I mean, daffodils are blooming and crocuses are blooming and the Daphne is blooming and, you know, the beach is beginning to bud out and so is the dogwood. So we give them names. But really, all that is, is the expression of love. So, Evan Alexander, who was a dyed-in-the-wool skeptic, who uh, was a neuroscientist at Harvard, and he got spinal meningitis, and he was in a coma for seven days. And when he came back, he was asked, you know, he wrote the book Proof of Heaven, which he hates the title because there's no proof. He says, there's no proof. And heaven is not a place. Heaven is already here right now. And he was asked to describe what he experienced. And he said, you can't put it into words. But he said, the closest I could say is love is the reality of all realities. The incomprehensibly wondrous truth that lies at the heart of everything that has ever existed or ever will exist. Wow. So I want you to come back to that, that image of the ocean of being, and then the little bubble of struggle, the place that most people live in their minds most all the time. And your compulsions are here to break you out of that. Your compulsions are here to bring you back to your heart so that you know what it says in The Course of Miracles, everything is love. Or a request for love. And that's what your compulsions are asking for. They're asking for your heart. And then they are asking, will you care for what I have been trying to take care of? Can you begin to see enough that you can open your heart to your fear, to your dread, to, to your loneliness, to your self-judgment, to your rage against life. Healing is learning how to enfold all of that back into your heart. And where we are right now, you know, on this planet, it truly is an evolutionary shift where the old is just getting so much stronger. You know, Trump is is uh, firing people and gathering more hawks in, in around him that, uh, you know, the uh, guy that's the new NSA guy, I can't remember his name, you know, he really is for, you know, bombing, you know, North Korea and, and, and you know, going to war with Iran and, you know, it, wow, it's so scary. But what is stronger than that is the human heart. And I'm inviting you today to use your compulsions to come home to your heart, not only for your own healing, but for all the children that are coming after us. So I want to turn it over. Let's see what this brings up inside of you. This is you know, this is not your normal compulsion class. You know, this is not the one, two, three, do this and you will control it. This is the healing that compulsions are trying to take us to. And we need to hear this over and over again. We need to uh, you know, learn this language. We need to gather together with other people that are beginning to bow to their compulsions in respect that this is their teacher, their teacher of coming out of the bubble of struggle and back into the ocean of being that is made of love. So 
let's see, just pause for a moment, just come back, maybe put your hand over your heart, breathe in and out through your heart, whatever works for you. And if your mind can't do either of those, just acknowledge the mind of how stubborn and resistant it can be. We can open our hearts to even that too. And as you settle in, check and see what's going on with your belly. And if you can, soften it. All the way down into your pelvic floor. And for a moment, be here. Pull your attention out of the mind that is always trying to be someplace else and know the safest thing you'll ever do is begin to show up for the living process that life is giving you. And this is the time, if there's any questions or any ahas, does this make sense about these two powerful tools. They're the only thing more powerful than our minds and our compulsions. The ability to pay attention, to investigate, to be curious, and the ability to give space to meet in the vast regions of our hearts whatever is here right now. So I must have been very clear today or very confused because <laughs> there's not a question to be had here. <laughs> or, oh, Denver. Hi, Denver. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, Good morning. Uh, my friend. Glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, always insightful, Mary, so thank you for sharing. Um, something that I wrote down that really resonated with me was this quote. Uh, I didn't get exactly what it was, but something about freedom comes from when we are free from anxiety that yeah. demands perfection. Yeah. And that, freedom just, comes when we are without anxiety. Okay. About non perfection. That's the game of our minds, of the conditioned yeah. mind. You know, we're not okay as we are and we need to be different than what we are. That's right. an endless game. You could go to your deathbed caught in that game, really. And so this quote is basically saying, oh, let's unhook from that game and instead be present for whatever life is offering. So does that mean, to me that almost speaks to me as like letting go of, I guess, expectation almost, right? Yeah. Is that is that the is that the practice of being present to what not should be or what you expect or what your mind wants to be or what you're projecting? Yeah. We have to be careful. Minds expect. <laughs> That's what they do. And we need minds to plan. We do, you know. But it's discovering how to live in the space that that's happening in. So that when you need to, you know, okay, my uh, mother-in-law is flying in from New York uh, at five o'clock on Tuesday, and I need to ask somebody to take care of the children. And, you know, that's the mind. It's planning. But it's learning how to use that quality of your mind, not having it take you over. Does that make sense? What it does, usually it takes over. You know, we're just constantly, you know, spinning our wheels. Are there signs that you know when it's sort of taking over that it's too much you get, or? You get tight. Sue, so, 
part of the reason why in the one of the classes we did this, you know, about really getting a sense of energy flowing. And if you remember, you know, the first time you fell in love, you know, <laughs> maybe it was a puppy dog or maybe it was a, you know, a woman, you know, and, and it, you can just feel, I mean, everything is light, you know, everything is, is moving. It, it, it's just, everything is okay with the world. You know, I mean, what used to irritate you doesn't irritate you because, you know, man, I'm in love, you know, it's so wonderful. So we rarely get that experience of our energy open and flowing. What I try to do is invite people to see how tight they are. That's why we did the belly thing today. And especially the anal sphincter, it can be one of your best friends. I bet you've never been in a class that said your anal sphincter can be one of your best friends, you know, but it, it is this biofeedback mechanism that uh, reminds you of how uh, tight you are most all the time. And maybe it's not your anal sphincter, you know, maybe it's the, you know, fist in your solar plexus, or maybe it's that your ear, your, you know, shoulders have become earrings, or maybe it's a, a, a constant ache in your jaw. To become a tightness detective, to begin to understand when you notice that you're again holding, it is guaranteed that you're caught in your mind. Now, that's enough at the beginning, but slowly and surely you begin to want to get to know what tightens you. Is it fear? Is it the sense of being all alone? You know, is it uh, uh, the, uh, oh my God, I screwed up and now I'm going to be fired? You know, slowly and surely, I think, did I share last week about the, um, the wind tunnel metaphor? Does that sound familiar? No, 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 no. Okay, I'll do this quickly. I know we have another chat, but we may just go a few minutes over here. So being caught in our minds, which is one of our brains, is like being in a wind tunnel with a 10,000 piece picture puzzle. <laughs> and, you know, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone in, down south of Seattle in these wind tunnels, you can go fly in you know, and they tra train you and, you know, it's really wonderful if you could get, you know, going, but then, you know, you get slammed against the side or it rips your clothes off or, but imagine that you're in that wind tunnel with a 10,000 piece picture puzzle. That's your mind. All we're doing is stepping out of the wind tunnel and going, wow, it's a wind tunnel. <laughs> and every time we step out of it, every time we notice that we're a tightness detective, we pull a piece out with us and we put it on the table in front of us. And at the beginning, you can't see, you know, there's five pieces of your 10,000 piece picture puzzle on the table in front of you. And then you get, you know, sucked back into the wind tunnel. But slowly and surely, you know, you begin to remember quicker, oh, I'm in the wind tunnel. And you come out and you bring maybe two or three pieces and you put it in the on the table in front of you and slowly and surely you begin to get to know what makes you tight. You get to know your struggling self. And that's where compulsions can be phenomenally powerful because whenever they are interesting, you are now going into the, the away from yourself and into the world of struggle. So does that help to uh, see it as a wind tunnel? Okay. And it doesn't, you know, as far as I can see, this is not the quick fix. There is no quick fix. This is the way out. And we're all on this call because we've tried enough of the quick fixes to realize, I don't think that works. And we're beginning to learn really the way out. And the first step is to turn your compulsion from enemy to ally. Yeah. So does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you. a day, just noticing how tight you get. Maybe you put a little dinger on your phone and just every time it goes off, just notice what's holding. Don't let that be a, uh, don't let that be, oh my God, I'm holding again. What's wrong with me? Just be fascinated with how much we hold, you know? And that cuts us off from the joy of being alive.
Thanks, Denver. Okay, so this is from Bonnie. So my compulsion has a million ways, tricks and methods to take me out of my heart and my consciousness and my desire to love and care for myself. It seems to go way beyond just noticing. Just noticing is not enough. My compulsion will slip under the radar of noticing or awareness. How can it be so powerful after so many years of noticing? Because most of us have noticed in trying to get rid of it. We enter it in a sense that, you know, I, I want this to be gone. And so it really is when you couple attention with your heart, you know, when you begin to be able to, it's what I talked about last week with the dread, you know, there was that sense of, oh my God, I hate this feeling, you know, and yet becoming aware that I've always left it and that doesn't lead to any good place. And as I started coming back, which we explored last week, how you come back is using sensations in your body, you know, how big is it, how deep is it, so on and so forth. I began to be able to see how young it was. So I invite you, Bonnie, to be as, it, it, what you said, it is more powerful than all of our attempts to control it. But if you can see how scared your compulsive one is, to really, you know, I can't remember the words you used, but, but, but they were really, you know, this is mean and, you know, uh, oh God, I wish, I don't know if the chat is still there or not. Uh, yeah, uh, it takes me out of my heart and it tricks me, right? So that is in an adversarial relationship with it. And I am willing to bet that most of your noticing has been trying to stop this. I really invite you, rather than see it as a trickster or somebody that, a part of you that is, you know, it's just, uh, oh my God, it's trying to take me out of my heart, to begin to see how scared it is. Does that does that begin to, is there a resonant inside of you when I say that? Can you see how that begins to change your whole relationship with it? It is just friggin' scary. And that we begin to not judge all its shenanigans. Instead, we begin to see that it doesn't know any better. You know, they, I was listening to that um, interview that Oprah did on 60 Minutes with the man that's considered the childhood trauma expert and so on and so forth. And it's really changed her life because what he said was in the young man that, that killed all the children you know, at the high school in Florida. He said, the interesting question isn't, why did he do that? The interesting question is, what happened to him? So it's the same with our compulsions, that they have now shown that everybody that has gone into shooting up schools has been deeply, deeply wounded. And starting with Columbine, you know, they really felt deeply ostracized and alone. And so I really want you to get the sense that this is not the bully, it's not the enemy, it's just very scared. Does that feel workable? Yeah, yeah, and let's, let's come back to it next week. You know, let's touch on it next week and we'll be looking at the third skill that's stronger than our compulsions next week. I think you'll find, you know, very uh, helpful, Bonnie. And, uh, and then we'll, I want you to uh, just bring in, whether you email me the day before or whether you do it through, you know, speaking or the chat button, to bring in uh, different experiences with your compulsions. And let's see if we can 
uh, weave this kind of work right directly into your experience of compulsion. So thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. And it's like I said at the beginning, I thank you for all the children that are coming after us. Even with all of the fear mongering and um, power playing and divisiveness on our planet right now, the only thing that is stronger than that is the human heart. May you wake up. May you come back to your heart. May you use your compulsion as a guide back to your heart so that you become a part of the healing of our planet. Thank you. Namaste. Bye. <laughs> so glad we're doing this. So glad. See you next week. Bye.